Finally, let's move on to talking about methionine and glycine balance. Many of the same themes will be illustrated in this next example, but methionine and glycine are two amino acids, methionine being more richly represented in muscle meat, though not exclusively, glycine being more richly represented in collagen and connective tissue, though not exclusively, as we will find out. Many of the anti-animal proponents or many of the anti-animal thinkers, nutritionists, pundits will say that eating animal foods will provide too much methionine, which will cause problems. What is that based on? Is that something you should really worry about? I say no, and I'll explain why right now. Within these plant-based circles, some will advance the notion that methionine restriction will extend life or mitigate oxidative damage. And not surprisingly, that is based on animal studies, something that some pundits may be willing to point out, but often is not at the forefront of the conversation. Studies like this, titled Methionine Restriction Decreases Mitochondrial Oxygen Ra Methionine Restriction Decreases Mitochondrial Oxygen Radical Generation and Leak, as well as Oxidative Damage to Mitochondrial DNA and Proteins. Previous studies have consistently shown that caloric restriction decreases mitochondrial reactive, reactive oxygen species generation and oxidative damage to mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial proteins and increases maximum longevity. Although mechanisms for this are unknown, we recently found that protein restriction also produces these changes independent of energy restriction. So this is the type of evidence that is put forward to corroborate the notion that we should either protein restrict or methionine restrict. And following quickly along with that in many of these plant-based paradigms is the notion that, well, animal meat is higher in methionine than plant protein. So if you eat more plant protein and less animal protein, you will protect your mitochondria and live longer, except that's not really the case. You will just become malnourished, very skinny, angry, uh, irritable, and generally kind of weak. Um, but they say here, we have found for the first time that methionine restriction profoundly decreases mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. Production decreases oxidative damage to mitochondrial DNA, lowers membrane unsaturation, and decreases all five markers of protein oxidation measured in rat heart and liver mitochondria. Okay, that sounds convincing. Until you hear the next part of the story, which is that when you add glycine to these rats, you can rescue much of this and you can extend the life of these rats. So this is quite interesting. And there are studies in rats and mice that show exactly this notion. This is a study from 1987. Many of these are old studies. The effect of dietary glycine on methionine metabolism in rats fed a high methionine diet. So these are the studies that many people will not tell you about. They will just say, oh, methionine restriction is good. It extends life, blah, blah, blah. They won't tell you, number one, that's in animals. And number two, that if you give these same rats on a high methionine diet glycine, you can rescue them. So they say from these results, it is suggested that the alleviating effect of dietary glycine on methionine, quote unquote, toxicity is primarily elicited by the restoration of hepatic glycine level rather than an increase in hepatic enzyme activity. And what they say here is that the addition of 2% glycine, 2% glycine to the high methionine diet did not cause further increase in those enzyme activities. The activities of methionine adenosyl transferase and cystothionine beta synthase were rather decreased while cystothionine gamma lyase activity was not altered. That's what they're saying at the end of this. But what they did in the study was uh, they said that the alleviation mechanism of methionine toxicity by dietary glycine was investigated in weaning rats fed a high methionine diet. When rats were fed a 10% casein diet containing 2% methionine, the activities of methionine adenosyl transferase, cystothionine beta synthase, and cystothionine gamma lyase, which participate in methionine metabolism in the transsulfuration pathway, were significantly enhanced. But the addition of 2% glycine, as I said, did not cause further increase in those enzymes. So adding glycine to a high methionine diet will rescue much of this quote unquote methionine toxicity. So this is interesting. They're not feeding rats steaks. What we find if we look at beef is that beef actually contains more glycine than methionine, even in the muscle meat. So this is quite interesting. Before we get to that, I want to show you yet another study that shows that glycine will extend the lifespan of male and female rats. Clearly, glycine is an important thing to have in our diets. Where do we get glycine? We get glycine from muscle meat. We get glycine from connective tissue, all of those chewy bits of steaks, the tendons, all of those parts, the parts that our ancestors certainly ate, wasting nothing, the parts that many of us cut away 
and leave for the dogs, well, the dogs are getting the best part. Glycine supplementation extends lifespan of male and female mice. Okay, glycine is beneficial. Glycine can mitigate methionine toxicity, and a small prior study has suggested that supplemental glycine could extend the lifespan of Fisher 344 rats. We therefore evaluated the effects of an 8% glycine diet on lifespan. We therefore evaluated the effects of an 8% glycine diet on lifespan and pathology of genetically heterogeneous mice in the context of the interventions testing program, blah, blah, blah. So uh, elevated glycine led to a small but statistically significant lifespan increase, as well as an increase in maximum lifespan in both males and females. Our glycine results, our glycine results strengthen the idea that modulation of the dietary amino acid levels can increase healthy lifespan in mice and provide a foundation for further investigation of dietary effects on aging and late life diseases. So perhaps it's not that we need to worry about methionine, an amino acid that comes in animal foods, along with so many other beneficial nutrients that are difficult to get in other places. Perhaps it is just that we need to make sure we are getting cuts of meat that have some tendons, some connective tissue, some fat, or eating some bone broth, or eating some collagenous tissue for our hair, skin, and nails. That will give us enough glycine. And interestingly, if you look at these analyses from a paper on the amino acid content of beef cuts, you will see chuck, flank, neck, plate, rib, and rump. The amount of glycine is going to vary from 6.26 to 8.57%. These rats in that other study, if you want to compare, were, um, were given an 8% glycine diet. So Meat is pretty darn close to 8% glycine at baseline. If you look up further in this paper, you will find that methionine levels are lower than glycine levels in the same cuts. Chuck, flank, neck, plate, rib, rump, 2.46, 1.88, 2.18, 2.06, 2.27. From 1.88 to 2.46 is the amount of methionine in these cuts. So actually in meat, you are getting more glycine than you are getting methionine. So even eating meat, as long as you are eating the connective tissue along with that meat, I think you will be fine with the amount of glycine. Some who have followed me for a very long time may remember that when I first started doing a carnivore diet before I evolved into an animal-based proponent, that is the addition of things like fruit and honey. I found those valuable for me from an electrolyte maintenance, from a heart palpitations, from a sleep, and from a hormonal perspective. Long-term ketosis, I think, is damaging for humans. I've talked about on the previous podcast and talked about why I added fruit and honey back and why I select those plant foods, those being the least toxic plant foods. But in my history, before I was doing that, when I was on a strict carnivore diet, I added collagen to my steaks. I was pouring uh, collagen onto my steaks because I thought that I needed extra glycine. I'm not convinced you have to do that anymore because I think we know that there's plenty of glycine actually in the connective tissue of steaks. Now, if you are just eating muscle meat with no connective tissue, something that our ancestors would never have done, if you're not eating chewy bits, maybe you do need to supplement collagen in that case. But like me, I have two thick tomahawk ribeyes thawing downstairs. And if you know tomahawk ribeyes, they have all sorts of connective tissue and fat and membranes. And you better believe I'm going to eat all of that. And if I give these things to my dogs, he will pick all of that connective tissue off. He knows the value. Ribeye knows the value of those things. Bones actually have collagen as well, which is higher in glycine. So you need a good source of glycine. If you're not going to eat membranous, tendinous tissues, then you do need to supplement with glycine uh, in some way, shape, or form. I say get it from your meat. Eat collagenous meat. Eat chewy meat. Eat chuck roast. Eat um, things like uh, stew meat. It's very chewy. It's also good to work out your jaw. Or just eat the tendons that come with your steaks or make a bone broth from tendons or knuckle bones, which you can get from a variety of places like white oak pastures et cetera, put it in the crock, crock, crock pot and get your bone broth. I have bone broth in the fridge, which I supplement with if I feel like I'm eating meat that's too lean or not getting enough tendon, but generally I don't even feel like I need it. And since stopping the collagen, I don't feel any difference or see any difference in my skin, et cetera. Uh, I think it's fine. There are some blood markers that I could check to make sure that my collagen is adequate or that my glycine levels are adequate. These are on the oat. You can do an organic acids test to look at those. That's a little beyond the scope of this podcast. It's something I've talked about in the past. I think for most people, just eat the chewy bits of steak. And if you can't eat the chewy bits of steak, then get some collagen in your diet. At Hardened Soil, we make a supplement called Hair, Skin, and Nails, which has trachea and scapula cartilage, which are my favorite sources of cartilage. These sources have been studied by John Pruden, a surgeon who found that there were unique growth factors and peptides in them that helped with wound healing and repair. So that's why we use trachea and scapula cartilage in skin, hair, and nails from Hardened Soil. The reviews on that one are awesome. It's a great source of collagen. I'll reach for that one from time to time as well if I want more collagen in my diet. I'm not a huge fan of mainstream collagens because they're hoof and hide collagen. It's pretty low quality collagen, better than nothing. If you're even getting fatty ground beef, that's going to have a lot of collagen. They're grinding tendons in there. It's 
it's probably fine. Remember, there's more glycine in there than there is methionine, even at baseline. So um, I think that there is uh, a lot to be said on that. And you don't need to worry necessarily about getting enough glycine, getting too much methionine, as long as you're eating nose to tail and eating all of the animal. 